this time, I like to be timely. I get antsy when I'm late for things. So I'm going to get started. People who show late, I talk about myself first, which is my favorite part. <laughs> people who miss it. Um, you may see me pull up my phone and look at it during the talk. I'm not Snapchatting. I'm just keeping track of the times. What do you expect there? So I'm not trying to be rude. Just lots of cover. And if it gets too noisy, at the end of the day, I'll just be on the door. All right, so this is inclusive design, thinking beyond accessibility. I want to thank you guys for uh, coming to my talk today and wanting to learn about something different. Uh, it's not really anything Google specific, it's a little more high level than that, but it's something that we all can get behind. So, as I said, first of all, I don't know if it's working. There we go, I have to turn it on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself first. Hello, my name is Mike Miles. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, way on the East Coast. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I've been working with Drupal since 2008. Uh, I've done everything under the sun with Drupal from the content entry on the Sherwell websites to deploying in our tech and large scale platforms for global companies. I maintain mechanical modules on Google.org. I am co organizer for the Boston Drupal Meetup, Sprints, and all this other fun stuff being for me. Uh, as I said, I'm from Boston where I work as the Associate Director of PhD for a company called Genuine. Genuine, we're a full-service digital agency, which means we're not a Google shop. Uh, we do a whole lot of things. Video production, digital and traditional, great design team, UX team, uh, strategy, SEO, and then development. And we have a .NET team, we have a front-end team that uses JavaScript frameworks, and then the PhD team, which is 99% Google. Genuine, we have offices in Boston, New York, Chicago, and right across the bay in San Francisco. So check us out online at wearegenuine.com or our Twitter, we are genuine. We have some cool projects. If you want to know any more about me, I'm sure by the end of this, you will want to. Uh, you can find me anywhere on the internet at my conversations. All right, so enough of that spiel. I tweeted this out earlier. I have a belief that we, everyone in this room has one thing in common. And that belief is that every day we want to make a positive impact on as many people as possible. No matter what our job is, if we are developers, how many people here would say they're developers? Right? Half the room, maybe a little less. How many people would say they're UX designers or designers who are different than UX designers? I may not have the whole thing made together. Um, or project managers, or people who don't get to the nitty gritty of technical deals. Right? Every day what we do when we go to work, whether we are building something for a client, for our company, for the college we work for, say, our goal is to build something that's going to reach people and have a positive impact on their life and share information with them. So how does this tie into my talk today, inclusive design? Well, a brief description of inclusive design is planning in consideration that ensure that a product, a service, or an environment is as usable by as many people as possible to the greatest extent possible. Sounds awful like what we all just said, you know, we do every day. Now this idea of inclusive design is not new, it's actually very old, well, not very old. I don't want to make people feel old. I don't want to discriminate against the age when I say old in my next slide. Um, it's based on a subject called universal design, which was coined in the 1960s. And inclusive design came from that. Now, universal design was coined actually by this man, Ronald L. Mace, who was an architect. He actually suffered from polio his whole life. And his thought process was that when you build something, you should think about how to make it as accessible as possible for as many people as possible. And he actually talked about uh, you know, physical locations, he was an architect. And he based that thought off of an idea that Sluan Goldsmith, who was also another architect, he came up with this idea called barrier-free design, talking about actually removing physical barriers from a space to make it usable. So pillars or stairs, placing them with ramps, planning those in your architectural plans from the beginning to make sure that whatever you're building, mostly public spaces, are usable. And the third piece of this universal design puzzle was Patricia Moore. She is an industrial designer. And she's famous, famously known for dressing up as 
uh, an elderly person and restricting her movement and then going out in the world and experiencing it and seeing what complications arose from that and what limitations were in place and then talking about that and sharing with people and, and working out ways to improve the way things are built. Um, all these people helped lead the way for ADA compliance, which in the 90s um, branched into digital. So I'll share an example of universal design, something that we all interact with every day and we don't even notice it. The slope curve. Right, this is at every, almost every point, every sidewalk, when you go across the street, it slows down to meet the road so you can easily get across. Now this was put into place to help people with mobility issues, people with wheelchairs, people with walkers, etc. But for building sidewalks and planning this way for people with mobility issues, who else did it benefit? Parents with strollers, delivery people with hand trucks, people distracted by trying to catch Pokemon on their phone. <laughs> right? All these people who weren't thought of when they were planning this, but benefit from it. Planning for the slope curve in universal design was thinking beyond accessibility, and that's what inclusive design does. It thinks beyond accessibility. So in terms of our digital projects, when we talk about accessibility, we tend to focus on four areas. Vision impairments, hearing impairments, cognitive abilities, and mobility or dexterity of people's hands, right? That's all well and good, and we should be planning for these things when we're building our online applications, our websites. But inclusive design goes beyond this. Inclusive design forces you to think about all the other differences that make up the human species. Our location, our gender, our language, our education levels our culture and background. All these things change how we experience the web. So inclusive design, when we use that in our projects, forces us to think of these things that are not accessibility issues, but are important ways to, that are important ways that affect how users interact with your online application. Now researching inclusive design, I came across the 10, pill, the ten principles of inclusive design which were drafted by this woman, Sandy Wassmer. She's a digital technologist, uh, inclusive design uh, person. She really gets behind it. She was hired uh, by the UK government around 2010, 2009 to help them come up with ways to build their digital properties in a way that was inclusive and could, be, could reach as many people, as many citizens as possible. So, she drafted these 10 principles of inclusive design. And I'm not gonna go through them right now. I could, but that'd be a really long session. I'd love to. But on her blog, I have a link here. Uh, Sandy talks a little bit more about what each one of these things mean. And actually in 2010, the UK government wrote these principles into their e-accessibility guidelines. So every web property that they build, they take these 10 things into consideration to try to reach the biggest audience possible. So using Sandy as inspiration, I've come up with what I call my four pillars of inclusive design. I'm going to copyright that, but it's Creative Commons 4.0, so you guys can reuse it and distribute it as you like. Yay, open source. <laughs> so these are four things that I wholeheartedly believe if we take into account and we all believe in when we build our projects from the very beginning, we're going to build a better web and have a bigger positive impact on as many people as possible. So these four things. No user is average. Every user deserves equal access. Providing understandable content for every user and understanding that every user deserves our trust and respect. So now what I want to do is I want to prove to you and go through each four, one of these, all four of these, and show you why they're important and why we should use them every day. No user is average. Okay, we're all special snowflakes. <laughs> <laughs> so if we believe that no user is average, what happens? Suddenly we have to start thinking from the onset of our project, from the very beginnings, the differences that make up our user base, the limitations that our users have, and we have to treat them as humans and not as this ideal 
person who's going to interact with our application. Interesting story. 1952, the US Air Force had a big problem. They had these new jets that were not performing well at all, sometimes stably so, which is very important. So what did the Air Force do? First, they blamed the pilots. They assumed, all right, the pilots don't know how to fly. Let's get new pilots in there. No improvements. Then they blamed the, tra the trainers, the training pilots. Swapped out the trainers, still no improvements. Then they swapped out the training material that the trainers used. Still no improvements. It took a while, but what the Air Force realized was the problem existed in the cockpit, the interface between the pilot and the aircraft. The problem was the way the cockpit was built was that the Air Force took all these different measurements of all their pilots, found the averages of all those measurements, and built the cockpit for the average pilot. Now, when you first think about that, yeah, that makes sense to do that. But when you think about it in actuality, it doesn't make any sense at all. And when they realized that, they threw out the idea of building the average pilot. And they went to their contractors and said, look, build a cockpit that works for our shortest pilot and our tallest pilot. Our, I don't know what the metrics they use. Um, and in doing that, and replacing the cockpit for one that works for all their pilots, suddenly the performance now, how many people here have ever adjusted a seat in a car? I was pretty sure I could see all the hands. Excellent. You can thank the Air Force for that. Changing that cockpit, they invented the adjustable seat that got carried down into the automotive industry. We all benefited from what they were trying to do. They reached a wider audience. So this story um, actually comes from a TED Talk called The Myth of Average by this man, Todd Rose who is a high school dropout and a Harvard professor. I think it's really great. Uh, he tells it way better than I can. Um, but he sums it up by saying, if you design for the average, we're literally designing for nobody. The Air Force realized this in 1952. We need to realize this when we're building our digital projects. That we're building for our average users, they don't exist. If we're going to a client and saying, tell us who you want to reach your website. Let's find the perfect person who has the best internet connection, who knows how to navigate digitally. Uh, that doesn't make sense to say that. But you get what I'm saying? That that doesn't work. So what we need to start doing, if we believe that no user is average, we have to start planning for those limitations. And in doing so, we reach a wider audience as we plan behind, beyond the average user, just like the Air Force did for their pilots. Now, there are a number of ways I'm sure we can do this. And I don't know all the ways. I'm not a genius. But I know a lot of smart people, so that's where I get all these ideas. So I have a couple ideas that I want to share with you, and I hope it's just inspiration for you guys to use going forward. First thing we can do is we can create personas in our UX phase that have limitations. How many people here have used personas before or heard of personas? All right, that's like 98% of the room. So personas, they're a way to put a face and a name uh, to your website, to what you're building. And you give that to the whole team, from the clients, to the designers, to the QA testers, to the developers. And everyone builds for that persona, to our set of personas. So if we build our personas with limitations, then suddenly everyone has to work towards those limitations. So what, am I talk what am I talking about? Simple things like saying, suffers from red, green, and color blindness, as I do. I suffer from that. These are blue chairs. They made me for a lot of them. Um, or a persona for a CEO who has a broken wrist due to a skiing accident. Suddenly they have limited mobility, temporary disability. Or your persona is someone who does most of their work while traveling. They're in a very distracting environment where they can't use audio, they have a small device, they're cramped, they're agitated, and it affects how they interact with well. If we plan our personas with these limitations, not only will our experiences be great for these people, but it'll be great for people who don't have these limitations as well, and beyond the edge. We can do things like impact mapping to get rid of the differences between our users and plan on what we all have in common, which tends to be our behaviors. Humans tend to act the same way no matter where we are. Impact mapping works like this. You start with the 
why. Why do you want a user to do an action? From there, you go into who's going to perform this action. Then from there, you describe the, how they're going to perform the action, and then what the end result would be. So this would be like, we want our users to share with their friends our website. Who's going to do this? Someone on a mobile device. How are they going to do this? They're going to expand uh, the hamburger menu. <coughs> What's going to happen is they're going to have a big button that they would like to share. Something like that. So if we use impact mapping, we start planning for our users based on their behaviors, and we can plan for the different who's, the different limitations, and the paths that they take to get to the needed endpoint. We give them a journey to take. All right, so if we believe that no user is average, what's going to happen is we have to treat our users as actual people's, people's actual people with limitations and differences. We have to think differently from the beginning of our project. What's going to happen is, from the onset, we're going to plan for a wider audience base and we're going to make a positive impact on our people. All right, pillar number two. Every user deserves equal access. If we believe that every user deserves equal access to our website, what's going to happen? We're going to have to stop assuming that everyone lives in Silicon Valley has a Google Fiber internet connection on a huge retina display. That's just one thing to think about. We're going to have to realize that people experience the web in many different ways, and we have to plan for those differences. Interesting statistic. As of 2015, 51% of US browsing is from a mobile device. Now, I know I just said, don't worry about the averages, and average user doesn't exist, but I think what this statistic shows is who here remembers just a few years ago when you'd have a client and you would say, do you want a desktop website or a mobile website? <laughs> right, it was, only, it was very not long ago that we would do that. And then something switched where we were saying, hey, you have a desktop website, you need to put a mobile experience on top of it. So today, when our clients come to us, we tell them, you need a responsive website. But we don't only really tell them that, we just build them a responsive website, because we know the market shifted. The same thing has been happening with accessibility, and it should have happened a long time ago, because the number of people who have um, accessibility issues and limitations. So we should, follow, yeah, we should follow the lessons we've learned from responsiveness, and we should start planning for the different accesses for screen readers, for, um, I don't know what other devices are. Let's say screen readers, let's say that. So how can we do this? How can we plan for different access? The most important thing I think we can do is structure our content and our code in a way that makes sense. Reprioritize what is the most important thing we have to load on the page to engage with the user. One great way to do this is to use semantic markup. Uh, now, the BBC, who they're kind of a big company, a big deal, <coughs> they have this very exhaustive guidelines that they follow for how to use semantic markup. The semantic markup describes the ways you use certain HTML tags, or pretty much all HTML tags, from emphasis tags to header tags to list tags, when they should be used, why they should be used, and how they should be used. The BBC outlines all of this, and it's an open source guideline that you can follow. And what it forces them to do, and what it would force us to do by using semantic markup, is plan our content in a way that makes sense structurally on a page. And that would help people, say, with screen readers, because they will read the content in the right way. Or whatever device they have access to web from, they're going to read the content the same way, the same markup. It's not based off classes and div tags that float things around. We can use progressive design to deliver experiences based on how our users access our applications. We have to remember that the purpose of design is to emphasize what is important to the user, is to call their attention to what our message is, what our products are, what our content is. It's not to be all flashy and you know, bells and whistles. So we start with the very bare minimum and we build up from there as we analyze traffic and how the page is loaded and what we, we, what's the word I want? We somehow figure out what device someone's accessing the application from. 
And finally, we prioritize what needs to be loaded. Do we need that third-party JavaScript library to add that carousel? Do we need those huge retina images? Do we need those fancy web fonts? Will our website work without those and look great without those? Can we make it work great without those? I am, oh, ah, it's like I told the punchline to a joke. Um, <laughs> So this is all well and great to help people with accessibility issues, but your, I don't say no, but your blindest, least mobile, and, oh, what's the other word I want? I don't know. That user is Google. Google doesn't care about how your web page looks. They care about how your content is marked up and how they can contextualize it and categorize it to deliver it to their users. So if you build an accessible way, you use semantic markup, structure your content in a way that makes sense, you're going to improve, improve the experience for your users who access your website differently, and then for Google, increase your, increase your SEO. All right, I have another statistic for you guys. The average global internet speed is 5.6 megabytes per second. Now, to put that in perspective, the average web page size as of 2015 is 2.2 megabytes. That means it takes the average user two seconds to load the average page. Now the slowest internet connection happens in the Republic of Mali. They have 0.5 megabyte per second connections. I uh, put that in actuality. Um, but to give you an example of what that means is if you are in Mali and you wanted to load Amazon.com, pending there are no DDoS attacks going on, it would take 16 seconds for Amazon to load. That's just the front page. That's just the front page, right? <laughs> now, the fastest internet connection is South Korea, where most users experience the web at 26.7 megabytes per second. They're number one. I'll tell you, the US is not even the top 10. We average around 14.7 megabytes per second. <clears throat> so if we didn't care about, if we didn't believe that every user deserves equal access, then we could easily just build our applications for people in South Korea and give them an excellent experience. But if we care about equal access, then suddenly if we start planning to give people in the Republic of Mali an excellent experience, then what's going to happen is everyone in between as well is going to have an excellent experience. Now these are the biggest extremes you can have. I'm not saying you have to build every website for the Republic of Mali, but you can start thinking about what are the differences in accesses that our users have for who we want to reach, what are the limitations they may have. A lot of the US is still on DSL or dialogue. So you don't want to plan for like Silicon Valley type kind of connections. How can we do this? There are a number of ways. I say we artificially limit ourselves. And you can do this using tools when you're developing. Like Chrome and Firefox allow you to throttle your connection artificially. That's how I figured out how long it takes Amazon to load Mali. I didn't fly out there. I just told Chrome, hey, draw my connection 0.5 megabytes per second. We can disable JavaScript and see can our website still load and be usable. This is one of the reasons why I get into constant arguments with UX designers and front end developers about mega menus. <laughs> Not that mega menus are bad, it's just most of the time people build them with JavaScript. So if you don't have JavaScript, maybe you're on a screen reader uh, that doesn't care about JavaScript or you're Google and you don't care as much about JavaScript, you're not going to be able to navigate correctly. We can try to see, can we navigate our web page without a mouse? Are we that CEO who has their broken wrist due to a skiing accident? Can we get to the checkout page for our product? Can we find out how to write a check for that nonprofit? Can't do that, then that's a bad experience for that user. So we can do these things, we can artificially limit ourselves. So if we believe that every user deserves equal access, what's going to happen? We have to start thinking differently about how our users access our applications and plan for the different devices that people use in the wild. We have to think about the worst connections possible to deliver the best experience possible. In doing such, we're going to have a bigger positive impact on more people. You guys still with me so far? Mm -hmm. Pillar number three. 
provide understandable content to every user. Excuse me. If we believe in providing understandable content to every user, what's going to happen? Suddenly, we have to think and realize that not all our users are knowledgeable of what we're trying to sell them or explain to them. That not all our users speak the same language we do that our website is in. That each user has a different ability to comprehend what we're writing to them. Most importantly, what we have to realize is that to us, the websites we build are works of art. From the design, to the UX, to the code, we want to hang them in digital museums for everyone to marvel at. To our users, they are just ways to get information. They don't care about the design. What users care about is being able to find out what they're trying to look for. So we have to realize that content is the most important thing we deliver to our users. So the city of Boston, recently redesigned their website, Boston.gov. I'm happy to say it genuinely played a big role in the development of this website. Now, in the previous version of the Boston.gov website, I don't even know how to explain it. It was structured not for their users. It was structured to replicate the way the city was structured in terms of their department. <laughs> yeah. So if you wanted to know about the street cleaning schedule, you had to know what department handles street cleaning, where the website that department was, the subpage for that, etc. So that was just one small example of how bad it was. So in redesigning their website, and they worked with their partner to figure out what is the most important thing to our users, what do they want to know about. So on the homepage, you come across these five things, which I believe actually change uh, depending on certain needs. And time of the year. Because the biggest thing most users want to know about is street cleaning, building closures, trash program, parking meters, fill lots. It's still on there. What's that? It is still on there. It is still on there? Awesome. And they figured, what is the simplest way we can explain what each one of these things are? Now, there is this great quote from an interview with Boston Globe, the city's chief of information technology, where they say, the website should act like a helpful human. This is one of the biggest differences between the old site and the new site. On the old site, it would feel like you were interacting with some sort of lawyer robot that was speaking <laughs> to you in government speak. I love that. Lawyer robot government speak. Yeah, that describes every government website. Except for Boston Go. Yeah. And it's changing. Thanks to Google and other technologies. Right? We don't want to provide lawyer robot government speak. We want to provide human-based content to our human-based users so that they understand it. One of the ways we can do this is by being clear and direct with what we write. We can use simple phrasing and avoid jargon where possible and understand that our users may not know about our subjects and start to think about what is the minimum we have to tell them to make our point known. We can pay attention to our fonts and our spacing and our line lengths. So if you're on a small device, or if you suffer from a dyslexic uh, limitation, fonts with serifs in them are hard to read. Letters run together. Letters look like they're struck out. So if we use sans serif fonts with um, nice letter spacing, font that's easier to read, it takes less mental capacity and energy to understand. And then line length. It's hard to gauge line length, but studies have shown that users read content in a pattern. They read the first line, they read the second line, they read the half of the third line, the quarter of the fourth line. They scan through it, they miss a lot of our content. So by focusing on how we can be as clear and direct with our content, we provide less copy on the page and less chances of them to miss what we're trying to tell them. And finally, don't be a lawyer robot. <laughs> Write our content in a meaningful way and check the readability of our content. So readability, uh, you may have heard it before when someone says, oh, that's a 12th grade reading level. That's a third grade reading level. Now that doesn't have anything to do with someone's education level or vocabulary. What it has to do with the amount of mental strain and energy it actually takes to understand what is written. And there have been studies that show a sixth grade reading level or what's considered a sixth grade reading level provides content that is engaging enough for experienced users 
but simple enough for new users or people who speak, say, um, who have more simplistic vocabularies to understand the content. So we can check readability pretty simply. I like to use a tool called HemingwayApp.com. <laughs> it's, it's a great tool, it's a great name too. So you take your content and you paste it in there, the Hemingway app, and it will show you the readability score based off certain algorithms it uses. It will highlight sentences that may be hard to read or very hard to read because they're very long. It'll show you and highlight things that could be written more simply with simpler phrasing. It won't catch everything, but it gives you an idea of how to simplify your content. I use this from everything from tweets to emails um, to blog posts. All right, if we believe that we should provide understandable content to every user, suddenly we have to realize what is content. And we have to provide ways to inform and guide our users through our website, not just the copy that we give them. Things like displaying useful error messaging. Because when a problem occurs on the page, we don't want to scare our users away. We want to give them an explanation about what happened and how they can resolve it. This is also great for like form errors. So we want users to fill out a form. We don't want them to have a problem and then just go away. We can, again, going back to impact mapping, plan our user's journey and then figure out what content we have to provide them in every step of the way to guide them on that journey to that shopping cart checkout, to writing that check, to just learning about our mission statement and our purpose. And then we can provide contextual relations between our content, like the city of Boston did on their homepage. The city realized if you want to know about street cleaning or you want to know about parking meters, you probably want to know where the tow lots are. I can tell you from experience, if you don't know parking meters, actually if you don't know street cleaning, you want to know where the tow lots are. And you want to know how much the table costs. $140 plus for the tow fee and $40 for the ticket. Right? But these are contextual. They don't technically have anything to do with each other. But contextually, for humans, they do. So they put them together. So if we believe in providing understandable content to every user, what's going to happen? We have to realize that content is the most important thing, so we have to write it away so that it reaches the most people. How am I doing, guys? 10 minutes, sorry. Pillar number four. Provide every user with trust and respect. If we believe in providing every user with trust and respect, what's going to happen is we have to consciously realize the most precious thing our users have is their information. And if we want that information, we have to be smart and respectful of how we ask for it and how we hold on to it. Now there's this awesome talk, it's also a podcast episode for the UX podcast, if anyone ever listens to that, titled Inclusive Design Excluding No Gender. And it's by this woman, Sarah Lierden. Uh She's out of Sweden. She is a strategist, a UX developer, and a um, great proponent of inclusive design. She got me interested in this topic. It's a great talk. And she summarizes this talk by saying, the easiest way to do inclusive design is to stop asking about gender. <laughs> now this is really interesting, and if you think about it, the underlying message here is that what Sarah, when she goes through this workflow with her clients and they have a gender question on the form, and it's required, she asks, why do you need that? What purpose does it serve? And most of the time, the clients say, I don't know, we've just always collected it. She's like, all right, get rid of it. You're not doing anything with it, and you're putting up a barrier to the entry for your users, protecting that intro. She references Facebook and Google that they do this, and they're smart about how they collect gender information because they need it for certain reasons. Drupal.org does this as well. On the user edit page for your account, there's a gender question. But they just don't limit it to male and female. One, they don't even make it required, but they give you choices so that you can identify however which way you want to. And they use this information for statistics, uh, for statistics and metrics because they know the Drupal community is vast and large and diverse. So this is the idea to be respectful and trustful of our users to only collect the information we need and remove those barriers. No one likes to fill out 50 forms or 50 form fields. Right? Ask ourselves, 
anytime we're going to collect information, do we need this data? What are we going to do with it? You can't come up with a good answer, your clients can't come up with a good answer, get rid of it, don't collect it. If you do need the information, say like how Google.org does, ask what options can we give to our users? How can we give them the tools to, as accurately as possible, give us their information? Do we have to make assumptions about what their answers could be? And finally, most importantly, we need to ask ourselves, why should users give us this information? We need to give them a reason, and a good one, and an honest one, about why they should provide us their information. So Pinterest.com, and yes, because of this talk, I have a Pinterest account now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a nice woodworking board. Um, when you sign up, they ask you, are you male or female? And there's an information toolbar next to it. When you click that, Pablo says, hey, we collect this information just so we can better give you search results. And you know what? If you don't identify, it's one of these two ways. Tell us how you identify. So we can use that to better improve the results we give you from the rest of our users. They're being informative about why they're collecting the info. They're giving me the choice of how I provide that information. So I feel comfortable and I trust that they're going to use it not for bad purposes, but for something that benefits me as a user. If we believe that every user deserves our trust and respect, we have to start being very responsible with our users' data. We need to explain to them how the data is being used. And this is a law for some information, as of right now. Say the EU, cookie policy. If you have a website that collects cookie information, you have to tell users that you're going to collect cookie information. It's not a stretch, and it's actually a reality that other countries are going to start imposing this. We should have done it a long time ago. And it's going to happen for even more information. We need to explain to our users how we're going to protect their data. There's a lot of data breaches out there. We want users to feel secure with how we're protecting their data. And we want to protect our data. And finally, we have to give users control over their data. Because that's what it is. It's their data. It's their information. It's not ours. We are just accessing it. So make it easy for users to keep their information up to date, editable, removable. Give them control and they will feel trusted that, and respected and they'll continue to use your products or encourage their friends to use it, at least if you're engagement. So if we believe in providing every user with trust and respect, what's going to happen is we have to recognize the fact that information is precious to our users and we have to build their confidence to be able to get it for our needs and we have to keep it in their control. We have to ask ourselves the hard questions about what information do we need and why do we need it. If we can't come up with an answer, we'll move those barriers. I'm like right on time. So those are my four pillars of inclusive design. No user is average. Provide every user with equal access. Provide understandable content for every user and believe that every user deserves trust and respect. How many people here feel like they could start using these pillars today on the project? Excellent. Thank you. Glad you guys said that. 100% of the room. I challenge you on your next project or your current project, use just one of these pillars in one phase of your project and see what performances and improvements it gives you. And note, since you've been such a great audience, I'm going to shorten it down to a tweetable version. <laughs> no average, equal access, understandable content, trust and respect. If we can all start doing this on every project, what's going to happen? Suddenly, we are going to truly make a positive impact on as many people as possible. All right, so I have a, some resources for you guys. And I'll put this up in a moment, uh, back up when we come back for questions. Uh, but I have a link to this presentation, uh, which, since I know you're going to experience it in a different way, you won't to hear me talk about it for 45 minutes, uh, every, all the slides are annotated for your convenience. I have just the slides on SlideShare available. I have a link to Sandy Wasmer's 10 Principles of Inclusive Design. I have a link to Todd Rose's talk on the myth of average. It's really uh, great, inspiring. I have the BBC's guidelines on semantic markup. And then um, si uh, Sarah Leonard's talk on inclusive design, including no gender. Are you going to be posting this on YouTube? Uh, yeah, all the sessions are being recorded, so it will be up on YouTube. Could you add this to the description? This, the information on this slide? I can, yes. I can 
can do that. Thank you. And actually, right now, if I set up TweetDeck correctly, the link to this presentation should be tweeted like right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll come back to this. Um, I want to make this presentation as usable and as positively impactful to as many people as possible. So I greatly encourage feedback and welcome it, constructive or otherwise. If you want to break me for whatever I said, you can do that. I don't know why you would, but if you have kind words, that'd be great. Uh, talk to me afterwards. I'll be at the party tonight. Um, and if I can do one little plug for myself again, um, I have a podcast that I started not too long ago with a buddy of mine. We just released episode three. It's called Developing Up. Uh, it's a podcast focused on the non-technical side of being a developer, so soft skills you need to both be safe and develop up your career. Uh, the last episode was dealing with burnout and developing burnout. The first episode is about how to write effective goals. Um, I appreciate a listen. If you guys want to give a listen, you can find us at developingup.com or DevUp Podcast on Twitter. We're on iTunes and all that. Um, but this isn't about me, so I want to thank you guys for spending the last session with me. Um, and if you have questions, we have some time for it. Technically, we have all the time we want since this is the last session of the day. Uh, but I'll put back up those resources slides and I will take questions after applause. <laughs> So, um, in terms of our involvement with the website, uh, we are just involved with the actual implementation and development aspect. Uh, but if, if they weren't aware of the current problems with their website, then I really question how much they actually use their website. Uh, I don't have a better answer than that. So, I assume the partner that they worked with and those strategies, um, they went through a bunch of exercise to really figure out that info. Any other questions? Comments? It's more of a comment. Um, website that I manage has a user base that's primarily over 65. And um, one of the things that, one of the questions that, um, or wait, two categories that didn't get incorporated in this is age. But they're among people who are most likely to have maybe have a equivalent, lower comfort level, et cetera. And it's always helpful for me to say, with my mom be able to use this? Yeah. As a person. That's um, a, because it ends up answering a lot of the other issues as well. If you're older, you're more likely to have hearing impairments. You're more likely to have visual potential ability yeah. impairments, maybe an outdated browser. And so if your mom is your target user, you can kind of pull a lot of those categories into one. No, definitely age and an aging population is a big idea behind this design. I should put it up on that slide which is a big circle. Um, especially because people are living longer. And so as as we all get older, there's going to be more older people. And if we're at this time, I actually talked to actually Ben sitting over there earlier about this. And you know, we're all in this age where we grow up or we're really experienced with technology and we're aging. So we have first hand experience with how this is going to change. And we're gonna make a change for us. Because we all unconsciously suffer from what's known as the false conscious bias, where we group ourselves with like minded people or, or people like us. So when we build things, we say, oh, this is going to perfectly for people. By that, we unconsciously need people like us. So as we get older, we have to start thinking about that. So but we should start thinking about that now. I totally agree in putting that as some sort of limitation, because it's not a disability. It's just a fact of life and a difference that can always happen. Font size will grow across the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best web pages love, like, one big word on them. <laughs> and it's all going to be carousels to read the next letter. <laughs> No, that's a great point. Like, I feel like there's always trade-offs here. Where, like you, you're increasing the font size, and I, I get complaints and from feedback from people. Like, oh, that's much of Yeah, it's so. How do you how do you make everyone happy? It's easily customized. <laughs> so the idea is that you it's to build it as usable for as many people as possible. It's not going to be ideal for everybody. But yeah, it's planning and knowing people are going to have differences. So how you can make it something customizable. Um, in terms of like, what's the smallest font size we have? What's the biggest font size we have? That's, I think, a harder thing where you need to start building in like user testing and look at actualities and see bounce rates and interview users to find out what's the problem with their application. But on the onset, getting them those choices to control that in that size. I mean, that's just one thing I know your question touches a lot more. If 
implementation. So it's some sometimes the browser in, uh, Zoom works. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't. My other student is saying like, okay, now I have to blow up my entire. I have to use this magnifying glass on my entire screen, and then I just scroll around. She gets frustrated with that. Yeah. So thinking about that. Planning on if someone's going to increase the display on the browser, whether it be because of poor vision or maybe a small device or other reasons, does our website, can that user get our important information the way we want to deliver a positive experience? So it doesn't have to be the world's best experience, it doesn't have to be this big flashy thing, but it has to give them access to the important information. So that's what it's all about, that's what all our websites are for. Excellent. Anything else? If not, then wrap it up. All right, thank, thank you again, guys. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, I did actually hit the important. I did. <laughs>